You're looking sharp, you're looking good, you've come so far. We know how to make the most of who you are. Father to son, it's what we've always done. To let the best of men forget. <laughs> Lately, I just feel tired. <laughs> I don't know, burned out maybe? Even a little demoralized? Not entirely, of course. It's not like I've like truly lost hope or anything. I mean, I do have tremendous hope in Jesus, his gospel. And thanks to his word and his spirit testifying together in me, I do retain a strong sense of hope. But I struggle against apathy. And I discussed this reality in a video some time back called Truth and Apathy. It was pretty well received, it resonated with a few people, and it ended on a pretty hopeful note. You know, but uh, here I am, coming up on about a year later, I think, and I still struggle to get excited about almost anything sometimes. Uh, in the gospel, Jesus has given us a tremendous hope, you know, the hope of, of the ages. But he's also given us a timeline of events. And when I look around now at how bad things are getting, all I can think sometimes is about how this is just the beginning of sorrows. So I'm not going to talk long. I just had to lend my voice here to explain what this video is about. It's not really just about drag queens or the transgender movement or any one movement. Uh, the gospel is the great equalizer of all humanity. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. All have gone astray. There is none righteous. No, not one. The gospel utterly strips us of the ability to look more favorably on ourselves than on others. And yet, we do. Well, I'll speak for myself. Uh, I still do. 
or at least I still catch myself having uh, self-righteous thoughts. I'll catch myself in the middle of deconstructing someone based on one prominent sin they display. And uh, I'll have that aha moment of conviction, finally. Uh, Once I've walked their sin back enough to some common point that I recognize in myself. And then at that moment, no matter how I was viewing them before, my heart softens and I become like that tax collector begging God simply to have mercy on me, a sinner. It's clear to me that self-righteousness leads to a form of self-righteous indignation. And then that inevitably leads to constant states of anger and bitterness towards the world. And the gospel dissipates all that, and it restores humility. Moved by the Lord's compassion for me, I experience what it's like having compassion for others. And then there's the Gillette commercial. And there are drag kids, and there are depraved men in the world who don't give two thoughts about what they're doing, making merchandise of children, vampires preying off young blood, stealing, killing, destroying, and I get pissed. And I ask, how can this be, and how did we get like this, and how fast until the bottom just completely drops out? You know, on a side note, I can totally see the simulated universe theory becoming the predominant view of reality for most people. If for no other reason than people are already pretty much living in a simulated reality. Sometimes it already seems like nothing is real. Nothing is objective. Nothing is true. Nothing is solid or consistent. And people are already living their lives under a giant false narrative. You know, how big of a stretch would it really be for the masses to buy into the idea that everything is really a simulation? But I digress. Anyway, while this video centers around the trans phenomenon, that isn't really what it's about to me. The reality is that the topic is so multifaceted and intersectional that I could talk for hours and barely scratch the surface. And I just don't want to. I just don't really feel like it. I feel like all of this and more is already being talked about and discussed and chewed on and regurgitated and ruminated on. Uh, It's YouTube. Uh, One reason why I don't make many videos is that I have zero interest in adding to the YouTube echo chamber. And there are many people who are more than adequately gifted to say all I have to say, and much more. I primarily wanted to share some more information with this video regarding the final siege of Jerusalem uh, in 70 AD, and the spiritual state that the Jews were in at the time, having utterly rejected their true Messiah. Uh, Parallels are pretty easy to draw. I'm most fascinated by the underlying disconnect from reality that was taking place, and how that contributed to an inner decay so much that they were a people conquered internally by sin way before they were ultimately sacked by Rome. So, I'm going to share a few video clips that I've come across lately and read a uh, chapter from Josephus uh, where he records some of the things taking place uh, prior to the siege. Okay. A 
think Megan uh, is so encouraging to all of us that have been doing ministry for a number of years <laughs> and to see some young faces. And I just want to thank all of our young people that have had the courage and maybe just the interest in what are they talking about to come and to hear some truth behind these issues. Um, so we have heard from those that have lived the certain lifestyles or life decisions that they've made. And so often what people forget about, or the culture, the culture message, are the children that are left in these situations. So I was one of those. My dad, uh, when I was young, he would just sign me up for ballet classes. He would sign me up for baton classes. It was something where I started to think, why, why is he really doing this, especially when there was a certain look in his eyes as he would ask me to dance in the living room uh, for him, or he would attend my ballet practice. And so there was some uncomfortableness, but I didn't know how to put the pieces together until I was nine years old, when he told me then of his desire uh, to become a woman. And at that moment, for a child, usually there's, a, I've found even, not just with myself, but there's a break off. You think, this is, your, this is your dad, and this is you. Two different people, right? This doesn't affect you, Denise. But what I discovered shortly afterwards is what was almost an immediate grief. I lost a dad. My dad doesn't want to be my daddy. He wants to be a woman. And he can't be my mom because I already have a mom. So I'm trying to process this in a quiet way. I did not tell anybody else out of shame, out of being embarrassed, trying to process this in my own mind. What does this mean? What's this look like for me? You know. And so by the age of 11, as I continued to keep this secret, I discovered that as my body was starting to develop very young, I was really getting disgusted with it. I didn't like it because you see what my body was doing was exactly what my dad wanted. And if God made a mistake, if by chance God made a mistake with your dad, Denise, how do you know you're really not supposed to be a boy? Now to actually take that thought, all it takes is one thought for the enemy to come in with any, any type of brokenness that we struggle from to take us into more of a mess that I would actually play this role out in my bedroom. I'd shut the door, and I would walk like a man. I would imagine what I would look like with the beard, with the mustache, the suit. And then I got to the point, what does this mean for a relationship? Because if you're really a boy, or you're going to become a man, then you know you're going to want to be married to a woman because you're going to want to look normal. And so to play that out, you know, of bending over and kissing a girl and, and just the mass confusion that had entered my life at that time. Well, I found that as this continued on in our home, by the time I was 13, 14, like I said, I developed young and I was not a very really petite young girl. I discovered that my dad was now into my clothes. I was finding them in the oddest places, behind the bathroom towels or in the back seat of the truck or up in the attic. And at first I thought maybe I didn't put those clothes away in the proper way, you know, the, I didn't put the fabric sheet. My mother worked afternoons, so I did a lot of the caretaking with my four younger siblings. And then it just reality hit me where I had to face what was really happening. And at that point I knew I had no boundaries. There, there were no boundaries between my dad, what was mine that did not belong to him. And so with this chaotic chaos continuing down the spiral effect, what does a child do? They look for somewhere to numb their own pain. And so I found that with alcohol. I would save up my lunch money and go drinking with my friends, you know, on bathroom breaks or football games, whatever it was to escape. I went through the phase that since I, my dad was not there to give me that affirmation uh, from a father's love, then I could find that in other boys. And so there was a little game that I started to play in the high school as I'd walk around. And once I captured somebody's attention or their interest for a certain period of time, it was on to the next one. So emotionally, I was a mess. Now today, as George had said, this is my frustration for you young people, for the young people that are going to come after you. If I would have went to high school to my counselor at 7th or 8th grade, and said, I'm really I'm struggling here, and I think maybe I'm supposed to be a boy. I can see what I look like, and it, I understand how they walk, and I'm really starting to feel comfortable in that. What do you think they would tell me today? To do it. And that's exactly what I say to the pastors when I have the opportunity to meet them. I don't know if I was living in today's culture, as all of you young people are, that I would be standing here as a man or a woman on the outside. 
Then, of course, we go on to another part where this is going to be impacting the children and where our churches really need to wake up because now we have transgender people, people that are identifying as being transgender, women that are not having a hysterectomy so that they can carry a baby, as we've seen uh, Thomas Beatty become the first pregnant woman, or first pregnant man, uh, and the different turmoils that are going on. I'm even hearing of the parents of the children that identify in these ways that are willing to carry a child so that they can have a grandchild because their child is transitioning to be the opposite sex. You see, the enemy's whole plan on this is destruction of the family unit. He's looking to take down the parents, just like all of us have shared about. He's looking to take the child down where there's no innocence and it's nothing but chaos. But the babies, these precious babies that are growing up in this confusion of Dad is really my mom, but wait a minute, he looks like a man, and what does that mean for me and how the enemy is going to use that? So again, I applaud you guys, the young people, for coming forward and to hear this and, and to really be, I know it's a lot to sort in, but this is, there's so much chaos behind this transgender movement, and I have never in my life seen anything move as fast and furious as this is when it damages people's health, emotional, physical, spiritual, every component to the human person of God's creation. Uh, and then th th you have post-structuralism, post-modernism having undermined any idea of, um, of history as having meaning. All interpretation is simply what we project and import into, you know, into the materials. And, and therefore, there's a style of writing now about, about society that, that is very fragmented. It's like the new historicism. Everything is, is very atomized and, and so on. There's, there's no, whereas I truly believe that there are huge patterns in history that can be observed. Um, that you know, and it's like a big, a big wave motion that like rises and then crashes and so on. And that's what I see: the, the you know the rise and, and fall of civilizations like over over the past five thousand years. Okay, <laughs> um, and so you've you've got this um, this without any um, if you have had no exposure to the disasters of, of, of world history and the um, you know the these sophisticated civilizations that rose like Babylon or Rome and and were and then became very sexually tolerant and then fell. Okay. And, and so there was nothing left but the rubble. So if, if you have had no exposure to that, okay, then you honestly believe this idea that we are moving, you know, it's progress visible all around us, and we're moving to an ideal state, the ideal culture, where there'll be, it'll be like sort of transnational, global, everyone will hold hands, right? and, um, and, uh, and, and everyone will be accepted for what they are, okay? and there'll be, uh, there'll be no more prejudice, and, and, there'll be, and, uh, and the environment will be pure and clean, and so on. I mean, they, the people have this kind of, this kind of magical view of what of utopia that's there 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 in the future and that this, this progressivist um, I, I could consider myself a progressive in politics but but the point is this progressivist idea that that we are marching towards some perfection okay, and that and that this and that, that the sit then the signs of it is are, are, the, are toler the toleration of the educated class okay for homosexuality or, or for you know or for changing gender or, or whatever that, that to, to, to me it's the opposite to me it's symptomatic okay of, of a civilization just before it falls, all right. which is that um, we, we are all very tolerant and we are not passionate, okay, but but there are bands of extremely passionate <laughs> vandals and destroyers you know, who are moving around the edges of, 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 of the civilization and who, and who bring it down. Okay? And there, it, this preoccupation, it seems to me, with, with gender issues and with gender identity and so on, okay, I, I, I think it's, it, I think it's, um, uh, you know, very, it's extremely limited in the long run. And uh, in, in this, this hyper self-consciousness about who am I, okay, who am I exactly? Where, where exactly on, on the gender, you know, um, you know, like a ruler in front of me. Where exactly on this on this spectrum, okay, it, am I located in terms of gender? Well, I mean, this is a kind of navel gazing. Okay, the time when ISIS is beheading people, okay, you know, and you know, in in the in the Middle East, it's like it's like a, a kind of a madness, okay, like self absorption. Right? So, I mean, the, the biggest problem, as far as I'm concerned, facing uh, feminism is, is is to to what degree, okay, Western feminism can be exported to the world. That that is more, I think, you know, the the complex issue of face, facing feminism uh, and to what extent uh, is, is Western careerist feminism um, you know um, a bad fit with with cultures that are driven by more traditional values family centered a uh, child centered um, religious okay in orientation I mean that that is the one that the part that needs working out
So this is from the History of the Destruction of Jerusalem by Flavius Josephus, written in 75 AD. Book 4, Chapter 9, Section 10. The Pollution of the Transvestite Leaders. And now, as soon as Simon had set his wife free and recovered her from the zealots, he returned back to the remainders of Idumea, and driving the nation all before him from all quarters, he compelled a great number of them to retire to Jerusalem. He followed them himself also to the city, and encompassed the wall all around again. And when he lighted upon any laborers that were coming thither, out of the country, he slew them. Now this Simon, who was without the wall, was a greater terror to the people than the Romans themselves, as were the zealots who were within it more heavy upon them than both of the other. And during this time did the mischievous contrivances and courage of John corrupt the body of the Galileans, for these Galileans had advanced this John and made him very potent, who made them suitable requital from the authority he had obtained by their means. For he permitted them to do all things that any of them desired to do, while their inclination to plunder was insatiable, as was their zeal in searching the houses of the rich and for the murdering of the men and the abusing of the women. It was sport to them. They also devoured what spoils they had taken, together with their blood, and indulged themselves in feminine wantonness, without any disturbance, till they were satiated therewith. While they decked their hair, and put on women's garments, and were besmeared over with ointments, and that they might appear very comely, they had paints under their eyes, and imitated not only the ornaments, but also the lusts of the women, and were guilty of such intolerable uncleanness, that they invented unlawful pleasures of that sort. And thus did they roll themselves up and down the city, as in a brothel house, and defiled it entirely with their impure actions, Nay, while their faces look like the faces of women, they killed with their right hands, and when their gait was effeminate, they presently attacked men, and became warriors, and drew their swords from under their finely dyed cloaks, and ran everybody through whom they alighted upon. However, Simon waited for such as ran away from John, and was the more bloody of the two, and he who had escaped the tyrant within the wall was destroyed by the other that lay before the gates, so that all attempts of flying and deserting to the Romans were cut off, as to those that had a mind to do so. <clears throat> yeah, as I read that, I'm just kind of blown away by what's being described there. Uh, I don't know the specific players, uh, involved and in, in what the exact context is here but I understand the general behavior being described is that uh, of a sort of transvestite gang that would prey off people and entice men by looking like women and then and then rob and kill them and uh, it was just something about uh, Jerusalem's history that I had not heard before. And so I found it interesting and wanted to share. That's all. Drag Queen Story Hour is uh, fantastic because uh, it ha addresses all of these issues of gender fluidity and self-acceptance um, and all of these topics that um, are real, are very, very real. And so is the backlash. Many negative comments have been posted online about the program. 
The AP has agreed not to use the drag queen's legal name because he said he feared harassment. But those are people who think that gay people are sinful or evil or, you know, bad to begin with. Um, so, you know, we're sort of just starting from such different places that it's kind of irrelevant to me.